evening, everyone, and thank you for joining us. I have six o'clock by my time, so we'll go ahead and get started. Uh, if you're looking for the GAP program or seminar about uh, good handling practices and medicinal herbs, then you're in the right place. That's not what you're looking for. You're still welcome to be here. I want to say thanks to everybody for joining us. And uh, I, my name is Adam Watson. I'm the Compliance and Grower Manager for Appalachian Harvest, which Appalachian Harvest is the food hub of Appalachian Sustainable Development. Uh, so Appalachian Harvest is actually located in uh, Southwest Virginia in Duffield, and we're also an herb hub. So tonight we're gonna to be speaking about uh, our, some of our work and related to uh, medicinal herbs, which we also uh, work as an aggregator, uh, just as we do with produce uh, for our produce farmers. We also work as an aggregator for medicinal herbs uh, for those harvesters and growers uh, interested in medicinal herbs. Uh, later on this evening, we'll have uh, Katie Commender also uh, chiming in and telling you more about our agroforestry program and how that herb hub functions. Um, so without any further ado, we'll get started. I will mention as we go through this evening, you do have the ability to ask questions as we go along. There's two ways to do that. Uh, one of those is a question and answer function within this webinar. The other would be the chat function. You're welcome to use those. I will mention it's difficult for me to keep an eye on those as I'm presenting. So we'll definitely review any questions we find there at the end. Um, and feel free to use those options. You can find those if you mouse down on your screen, either to the top or to the bottom, you should be able to find those. So Q&A as well as chat will give you the option to uh, ask any questions. So what is GAP or Good Handling Practices? Well, GAP stands for Good Agricultural Practices and GIP or GHP is Good Handling Practices. And what they both are is a best practices approach to minimize the risk of microbial contamination of produce as it moves through the supply chain from the farm uh, to ultimately the consumer's plate. Uh, we'll be looking at a gap and gip through the eyes of medicinal herbs, uh, which are very analogous to produce. Uh, it's not a new concept. It's not something that's recent. It actually goes back to a 1998 uh, publication from FDA. Uh, the uh, reason they created this document was actually uh, in response to foodborne illness and produce. And essentially the theory was, rather than deal with uh, foodborne illness after it happens, can we prevent it further up the chain uh, and reduce the number of issues? And so that's why it's a best practices approach and it does focus on microbial contamination. So if we look kind of as the basic process on the farm, uh, what we find essentially is a farm would go through and look at sources of microbes, which are our main focus. Uh, they would need to understand how those microbes would move on the farm, what practices they could implement on their farm to prevent movement, and then corrective actions to address problems because things don't always work out the way you expect. Additionally, uh, they would examine how they're going to monitor and document their actions uh, because records are a very important part of GAP and GIP if we're talking about third-party audits or certifications because um, essentially without records all an auditor can say is yes on the day I was on that farm or uh, with that producer things were done correctly and while that's good what they need to be able to do is examine records and say, even when I'm not there, the same activities are occurring in the same manner and things are appropriate. And so that's why records are so important uh, to GAP and GIP. And we also see the same reliance on records in any number of third party audits, such as organic certification. I will mention that as we go through this evening, uh, you're not going to necessarily find uh, a ton of new information that you hadn't considered. Uh, I feel that gap is normally common sense for most people, uh, but it's still, even though it is common sense, it is the best way for a farm to protect itself from uh, microbial foodborne illness. So it is important to pay attention to. We don't want to uh, downgrade it too much and, and not give it proper attention, but it is something that is not necessarily going to be revolutionary to you. So why could microbial contamination occur with produce or even with medicinal herbs? 
Well, one thing is they're grown in an open environment, typically, where we're talking about field-grown herbs or wild harvested or wild simulated. Uh, typically, we're dealing with things that are in a very open environment. There's not a lot of control. And because of that, we can have contaminants introduced into that environment. Another thing to keep in mind, some of these herbs are going to be in place for several years before they're harvested. And so over that period of time, what possible threats could present themselves? Additionally, produce and medicinal herbs themselves are actually favorable environments for microbial contaminants. And what I mean by that is they can actually grow on or even in the product that we're going to be interested in harvesting. Uh, and additionally, Microbes can also become internalized through those harvested uh, products. So it's not just uh, something that we see on the surface or something that's readily apparent from outside of the harvested product. It can actually become internalized, whether through natural features, uh, such as stem and bud scars on plants, or even mechanical injury and things like that. We would look at the same microorganisms for medicinal herbs as we do with produce. Uh, we focus on bacteria, viruses, and parasites. Uh, one thing that GAP itself does not focus on are some of the more product quality organisms such as yeast or fungi, uh, which is something that does deserve a lot of attention within medicinal herbs, uh, but it's not something we're going to focus on today as part of GAP and GIP. Bacteria, real quickly, are a microorganism that can actually multiply inside and outside of a host. Uh, and it's important to mention that when we're talking about host uh, in terms of GAP, it can be a human worker. Uh, so that's something that we'll mention later on about hand washing and things of that nature. But hosts can be animals, whether wild or domestic, and even humans themselves. Bacteria multiply quickly when given the right conditions. So if you supply them with water, food source, and proper temperature, you can very rapidly grow a large population of bacteria. Uh, and the thing about that is that with most things, uh, the more bacteria that are present, the more likely you are to see an infection take. So the old adage, the dose makes the poison, it's kind of the same thing. If you have a sufficient number of bacteria there, they can cause problems. And the more that are there, the more likely we are to see problems. So what we do with GAP and when we look at bacteria is we look at how can we reduce the risk of bacteria by minimizing situations that support bacterial survival or growth. Viruses are small particles that multiply only in host uh, in the environment. So it's something where we do have to have a live host associated with viruses. Uh, oftentimes that source is actually a worker who is ill. So if they're handling fresh produce or by extension medicinal herbs or perhaps uh, their actions are contaminating water, then we can have uh, an outbreak happen. Virus particles typically only it takes a few so it's not something where we need a large number of people that are ill to uh, precipitate uh, the outbreak. Um, the, the virus particles themselves can often be very stable in the environment, uh, and there's actually only limited options when it comes to sanitizers. So again, prevention is a key that we like to focus on with viruses. Parasites uh, typically uh, are not super common with even produce, but it does happen from time to time. Uh, typically we think of things like protozoa or intestinal worms. Uh, they again also have to have a host to actually multiply. Uh, very often, the source of parasites is water that has become contaminated. They are stable in the environment. They're often not killed by sanitizers. <clears throat> Excuse me. And they can actually incubate or survive within a host for a long period of time before we actually see signs of illness. One example of a parasite is actually Cyclospora which causes cyclosporesis that sometimes we do find associated with contaminated water. What we see when we look at the general population is not all individuals are equally susceptible to foodborne or medicinal herb-borne illness. So who is most susceptible? Those most likely to uh, contract a foodborne illness as well as to have the most severe uh, cases are infants and children under five years of age, elderly, pregnant women, and people that are otherwise ill or immunocompromised. Uh, and the difficulty we always have with this as producers or Appalachian Harvest as an aggregator is 
we never get the option of choosing who our ultimate consumer is. So we always have to consider that we are creating a product that is going to possibly uh, be utilized, uh, whether eaten or otherwise, by these susceptible populations. And so our efforts focus on protecting everyone. One thing that's important to mention up front, when we look at all those different microorganisms of concern, one of the single uh, common factors that we see linking those is fecal matter. So fecal matter is a tremendously good source of pathogenic microbes. So that is to say it's a very serious concern. <clears throat> and when we're talking about fecal matter, it's not just waste from wildlife or even domestic animals. We also have to include humans in there. So whether it's a malfunctioning sewage system, uh, employees not properly washing their hands, or some other way uh, that fecal matter is introduced into the production environment or the handling environment, fecal matter is always a focus and always a concern for us. And we'll talk about, for instance, how manure can actually be used in a production system safely and appropriately. So we'll talk about how that can happen. The other thing we want to focus on with GAP and GIP is water. Because one, depending on the source of the water, it may itself be a source of microbial contamination. But secondly, it's a vector. It moves contaminants around very well. So if you have a, a contamination issue in one area, water can suddenly take it to our production areas or our handling areas and cause greater issues. So we do like to focus on water as well. One thing that often when we work with produce farmers to try to illustrate how important and how large of a concern we have with foodborne illness is to ask the very simple question, how many of you have ever had the stomach flu or the 24 hour bug? Most people will have had that in some time in their life. And when you start asking, well, what sort of symptoms did you have? Generally, it's gastrointestinal distress, whether it's diarrhea, upset stomach, cramping, sometimes fever, and things like that. And then you follow up with, could it have been a foodborne illness? And in all reality, it very likely could have been because stomach flu does not really exist. Influenza does not act like that within the human body. It's not just going to last, last for a very short period of time. And all those symptoms are all common symptoms associated with any number of different uh, foodborne illnesses. So it's very common that someone could have a foodborne illness and it not be serious. Uh, so even though they're not all serious, we do take them uh, greatly under consideration uh, when we try to uh, build our production systems. One thing sometimes that we see with producers is they'll just sort of ask the basic question, well, why don't we just wash things better? Why don't we just wash produce? Why don't we just wash the herbs? Won't that take care of it? And unfortunately not, uh, because as we mentioned earlier, contamination can actually be inside of the harvested commodity. It's not something that's just on the surface. So unfortunately, washing or the absence of dirt, saying that something is clean, does not necessarily mean it's contamination. We're dealing with microbial uh, organisms, so it's not just something we can examine them with the naked eye and make a judgment call, is this safe, is this not safe? So what we look at is a preventative approach, uh, because really the curative approach doesn't work. I'm not going to be able to pre uh, present to you this evening any sort of method or product that we can use after something has been um, contaminated that's going to make everything okay. Uh, the only way we can do something like that is to have a kill step. And typically when we're talking about food, the only kill step that we would have is cooking it or sometimes high pressure processing uh, to actually uh, kill the organism. Typically when we're dealing with medicinal herbs, we're not going through high temperature treatments or pasteurization or things like that. So we don't have curative options to solve foodborne illness or microbial contamination once it occurs. So the only effective strategy we have is to actually prevent it. And so that's why with GAP and GIP, we always focus on preventing the occurrence of contamination rather than finding some way to respond to it, because in truth, we don't have effective responses. So I, it is important to say this, that even though we may adhere to all the best practices within GAP, 
and it should reduce the contamination of uh, con having herbs contaminated. Uh, we can't say that there is a zero risk just because we followed GAP. GAP does not eliminate risk. What GAP does is build a program that says following these practices should result in a better outcome. Um, because we are dealing with a product that grows, like we said before, in an open environment, it's not going through any sort of treatment that would eliminate or kill those microbial pathogens. We can't say there is zero risk associated with medicinal herbs. But again, GAP is a good system to follow. A good basic step to sort of begin implementing GAP on your farm is to actually just create a map of your farm if you don't already have one and just show on it, annotate on it where you have production areas, water sources, and potential contamination sources. So these could be things that are on your land or maybe it's an adjoining land use issue. So maybe you don't have livestock on your farm where you're growing herbs or where you're harvesting from, but maybe your neighbors do. And so understanding uh, what potential contamination sources such as livestock or a septic field or things like that exist helps you better understand uh, your overall farm picture. When you're looking at actually growing uh, product, you do want to look at those sites and consider some things before you plant. Uh, so again, typically, you know, in most uh, areas we deal with, there's adequate uh, areas of uh, agricultural land or even wild land. People are doing wild simulated, but you know, obviously, we wouldn't want to be using areas that have a history of some sort of chemical contamination or have been dump sites. Um, we need to pay attention to manure. Uh, it's not that we can't use manure in production, but when manure was there is very important and we'll expound on that later. If we have areas that are subject to flooding, we have to take that into consideration. Could that present a contamination issue? Uh, burn sites, sometimes uh, people will burn things such as treated lumber or other materials that themselves could introduce non-microbial contaminants into a production area, so we want to be aware of that. And again, adjacent land use is always something to pay attention to. Uh, could we have a source coming from off of our production area where we have control, uh, and how would we address that? Um, one thing I do always stress with folks, typically we don't see this in a commercial production scenario, but sometimes backyard gardeners, uh, they're limited on space and they may want to plant over uh, lateral lines associated with septic tanks or things of that nature. Uh, we don't want to be harvesting materials that are planted over drain fields. Um, and one of those reasons is if everything's working correctly in that system, there's probably a fairly low chance of, of any issues happening. But the problem is we don't always see a problem immediately when it first begins. So what's happening under that soil? What's happening further down where we have roots? So we never want to be looking at harvesting produce or medicinal herbs that are associated with being planted over drain fields or otherwise uh, associated with septic systems. And also pay attention to uh, what's next door. Is there some sort of septic treatment facility that maybe if there were a spill or an accident would impact your production area? So those are the sort of things to consider. So I mentioned this earlier, and if we ask the question, can I use raw manure and still be following gap practices? The answer is yes, but it's very specific on how we can use it. Right now, what the basic thinking uh, with gap is, uh, in lieu of there being any other regulation, is an adoption of the uh, manure use standards associated with the National Organic Program. If you're familiar with those, they say basically, either 90 days prior to harvest or 120 days prior to harvest is the latest that you could apply manure and incorporate it into the soil. First off, incorporation should always be a requirement. In part, when we don't incorporate manure, we uh, have large uh, significant losses of nitrogen due to volatilization. So one of the things people apply manure for typically is for nitrogen content. So for not incorporating it, we're actually not doing as well with it as we thought. So there's a lot of reasons beyond food safety for incorporation, but one of those is to actually get it into the soil and have it break down faster. Additionally, 
with manure use, the 90 and 120 day difference is based on what product is harvested. 120 days is required if the product has direct contact with the soil surface or particles. So something like melons, root crops, things of that nature that are in direct contact with the soil are definitely at the 120 day restriction. Things that are more elevated like sweet corn, typically peppers, steak tomatoes, things of that, we typically could allow with just a 90 day prior to harvest window. Uh, it gets a little complicated sometimes when you start considering things like rain splash and stuff like that. And so should we maybe look to err on the side of caution and always use 120? Maybe. Uh, but again, if you have a product where the harvested portion is not uh, in direct contact with the soil or not close proximity, then you may be able to use the 90 day feed. So what that means is that we can't be side dressing with manures or doing things like that. One issue that always pops up is, well, what about compost? The issue with compost is what a lot of people consider to be compost. It's not quite compost uh, as we would like to see it in uh, food safety or even in the National Organic Program. So there are very specific requirements for something to be called compost in the USDA National Program. And those are related to both the temperature which it reaches as well as turning requirements and how long that temperature has to be at a certain level. Uh, so we would say that unless you have a uh, record showing the temperature, the turnings and the duration of the process, any material you have that you would, that is of animal origin. So if we're talking about manures, uh, if you don't have those records, no matter how far broken down it is or how old it is, we would still regard it as being a raw manure because without that documented uh, records of meeting the requirements, there's nothing there that shows that it went through a process where it should have killed any microbes of concern. So that's what a compost process does. One of the many things is it actually reaches a sufficient temperature to kill microbes. If we don't have records that demonstrate that, we always say operate uh, in a sense of caution and use it as a raw manure. So again, observing the 90 and 120 day rule. So keep detailed records whenever you're using uh, raw manures or compost as well. We want to keep those records on hand. So things such as application dates, rates, and source of manure, always incorporate raw manure into the soil, no side dressing, and always follow the 90 and 120 day rule. Um, quickly on water and animals, we mentioned before, Water can become easily contaminated with fecal matter, no matter what the source it's coming from. Uh, and because of that, uh, it is a, a significant concern to us. So if we just look at a typical surface water system in central Appalachia, uh, just looking at this picture, looks like a healthy ecosystem, but chances are if we actually tested that water uh, for E. coli, we would actually get a positive result or we would find E. coli present. When we test water, typically what we're testing for is actually E. coli, not because it is of greatest concern to us or not because uh, it alone is a problem, but E. coli is an excellent indicator. So when we have water that tests positive for E. coli, what that tells us is that that water source was contaminated with fecal matter at some point. So it's been exposed, it is suspect. Um, so again, water can carry pathogens and surface water in particular almost always will fail uh, to test uh, clear of E. coli, which is our indicator species. Water does pose not only a direct use, uh, a risk whenever we're using it, so it's easy enough to consider it when we're spraying water onto a crop, if we're irrigating or if we're washing products, but it's also a risk when we think of things like runoff. So if we have animals and produce or medicinal herbs on the farm, uh, does water from the animal areas drain into our production areas? If so, then we have some issues there. Maybe we might have to look at doing a ditch or a berm to divert water away from our production area. Um, also flooding that can happen. Certainly uh, this year across the US, we've seen a lot of flooding. Flooding itself can actually be a issue. One note about flooding, uh, the FDA considers 
any harvested product that comes in direct contact with flood water to be adulterated. And adulterated products cannot be sold for food, whether for humans or for livestock. So we're not talking about necessarily direct contact, but even just introducing contamination into an area, flooding is an issue. And so what we have to do when we look at our farm, what ways are water uh, interacting with our production on the farm? Can be direct, and it can also be indirect. Uh, runoff potential, always pay attention to that before we start planting. We don't want to find out that we have an issue after we've made that investment. So things such as ditches, grass buffers, and berms all can help mitigate potential risk there. Uh, if it's something we have control over, if it's our animals, if it's our manure storage and things like that, certainly we have maybe a little bit easier time than if we're talking about adjoining land use. Uh, but always pay attention to those. Uh, one thing that uh, should be mentioned and really focused on, if, if there's one slide to pay attention to, is this one. Should have made it extra pretty with a nice picture. But wash water. Whenever we're talking about washing medicinal herbs, um, the water that's used for that must be potable. Uh, and what I mean by potable is actually of drinking quality. Uh, so there's a couple ways we can arrive at whether or not water is potable or not. The basic one is if you have a municipal source, you can rest assured that it is potable water. That's going to meet those minimum standards. Aside from, you know, those limited times when there may be a bold water advisory or things of that nature, municipal water has to meet uh, the level of potable, so you're good. When we're talking about wells or springs, because a lot of central Appalachia has areas that does not have a municipal system. So a lot of people have their own water sources. Uh, it's important to note that history of use does not indicate potability. So what do I mean by that? Just because you and your family have been using that, str that spring or that well for the past 30 years, in absence of a test, we can't assume that that water is potable. So I would say that uh, to assure yourself that you are using potable water for washing, uh, you would want to have a test within, I'd say, a month of harvest or washing uh, to be reasonable. When we're talking about surface water, like ponds, streams, rivers, there's almost never a situation where one of those sources is going to test acceptable. There's always going to be the presence of E. coli and, by extension, fecal contamination. So really the only way that we can uh, use those sorts of waters is if we were to treat them somehow. And quite honestly, it's not practical in most instances to try to treat uh, a water body like that for a wash source. Uh, there are some ways where if you're doing a limited container uh, and you can do some things like that, but honestly, most of the time it's easier to take product to what's known to be a safe source, rather than to take a surface water source and try to turn it into something acceptable. And in fact, that's one thing that Appalachian Harvest is able to do. We're on a municipal system, uh, and we have the ability to allow folks to use our infrastructure, and that's something Katie will mention uh, later in more detail. Another thing that we do want to consider uh, whenever we're talking about harvest are animal intrusions or evidence that we have potential contamination because again fecal matter especially is a huge red flag for us and we know that in our fields and in the forest we have animals so what we would want to look on are things that are very specific so if we have animal excreta or fecal matter there nest signs of feeding pecking or otherwise eating on a product rooting trampling grazing or bedding are all indications that we really need to pay attention uh, to uh, the product we're about to harvest. One of the things we need to consider is timing. So are we having these animal incursions when we're near crop maturity, when it's close to being harvested, or is it months in advance? Obviously realize with forest grown uh, botanicals, you're not gonna be able to control whether or not animals are around there. It's part of the environment. But what we do want to pay attention to is if we're getting ready to harvest, do we see where there's been a lot of animal activity? Is there a lot of fecal matter? If so, we may want to wait uh, and maybe harvest the next season from that area rather than possibly pick up uh, a contaminated product. The other thing to consider is, you know, where are we seeing this activity? Is it directly on a harvested portion? So for instance, if we're digging roots and we're finding where uh, 
whether it's a mouse or a vole or whatever is chewing on a root or something like that, clearly something like that that's had direct interaction from an animal, we're not gonna wanna harvest for product. We're not gonna put that into the stream of commerce. Uh, versus, you know, we have animals feeding around it. We have animals browsing the top of something, but we're harvesting the root. That's not such a big concern. But again, directly on harvested portions, we're going to have great concern if there is animal activity. The other thing to consider and focus on is physical contact with uh, the harvested commodities. So basically, we're concerned anytime we have something touching what we're ultimately going to sell as our product. So whether it's tools, harvest containers, even our hands, uh, as well as wash water and washing areas, uh, or even drying equipment, all of these are potentially uh, sources that if they become contaminated, could then contaminate um, other uh, uncontaminated herbs just by the fact that we started contamination. So it's important that we understand how we can manage these areas to limit uh, contamination. One of the very important things uh, for produce, and it would extend to herbs, there's a whole list of activities where after which you should wash your hands before you start handling either herbs or produce. Um, I kind of turn that on its head and I always just say that the bottom line on hand washing is that immediately before you start handling that harvested commodity, you should have washed your hands because now we don't have to waste any mental energy or time trying to figure out, was this one of those activities where I should have washed my hands, you know, or did I do something clean enough I don't have to worry about? So we always wanna wash our hands immediately before we start handling any product that we're harvesting for sale. The reason being, it goes back to humans are an excellent source of a lot of these microbes. Um, and proper hand washing is important. So, I'm sure most of us on this webinar are probably adults, and while we think we know how to wash our hands, washing them effectively does actually have a little bit of system and effort to it to do it correctly. So uh, we want to wet our hands ideally with warm water, but the warm water is not an absolute necessity. We want to apply soap, lather our hands for 20 seconds. Um, 20 seconds is about the length of time it takes you to sing your ABCs or happy birthday through twice. Uh, so when you think about 20 seconds, that means if you've got a lot of people washing your hands, you want about three a minute or less that's actually able to do this. So it does take some time to do it correctly. You want to concentrate on all areas of your hands as well as scrubbing up the forearms near the wrist. You want to make sure you rinse thoroughly. Dry with a single-use paper towel rather than a cloth one. And the reason is cloth can easily become contaminated. So if one person does a poor job of washing their hands, they have contamination on their hands and it's left on that cloth towel, the next person can suddenly have their clean hands contaminated by that cloth towel. So use a paper towel. And uh, if possible, use a paper towel to turn off the water, open the door, and then throw the paper towel in an appropriate trash receptacle. If you don't use soap, if you don't lather your hands for at least 20 seconds, you're not sufficiently washing your hands. Uh, they've done the research, and when you start actually looking at where do people fail to wash their hands, oddly enough, those areas in red, as you see on the screen, are most missed portions. I don't know of any way of handling and you know picking up things like herbs or like produce that you can accomplish that without using your fingertips and your thumb and yet they're often poorly washed. Uh, so again, make sure we're washing all of the hand well and taking the time to do it correctly is important. What about hand sanitizers? Hand sanitizers never substitute for hand washing. Uh, it may be a good added second step after washing hands. There's certainly nothing wrong with using hand sanitizers, uh, but they don't substitute for it. Uh, so don't think that just because you're in a situation where maybe you don't have sinks immediately available that well, if I use a hand sanitizer, it's just as good. Unfortunately, it's not. Uh, but what is good is you can very easily create a hand wash station. Uh, these are used a lot in uh, produce operations because oftentimes you have fields that are not near uh, normal bathroom facilities and sinks. So all you have to have is a container of potable water. It doesn't have to be potable. Uh, we can't wash our hands clean with contaminated water. Uh, 
it needs to have a free flowing valve on it. So this picture shows some sort of thermos type uh, situation. You can use those, but honestly, a five gallon bucket uh, with a valve that you install yourself is perfectly acceptable. You need to have a catch basin for the water so it can be discarded of either in an area away from production or even uh, into a toilet or other uh, sanitary system. Liquid soap, disposable paper towels, and then a waste container for those paper towels. Uh, and so we see these oftentimes in the back of pickup trucks. There are formal, uh, very nicely made, um, expensive ones, unfortunately, that can be purchased. But a lot of farmers just find a way to create this system uh, easily and inexpensively, and it works great. It allows them to have hand washing out in the field so that uh, they can have workers have clean hands when they're picking produce. Uh, and obviously, um, the same would apply to medicinal herbs. Gloves are sometimes something brought up. The uh, issue with gloves is they're only effective and good if the hand is washed before you put it on. Uh, gloves are not any sort of magical germ destroyers. All they are is simply a barrier. And if we've ever used gloves in an uh, agricultural setting or medicinal herb harvesting or anything like that, you'll know very quickly that they very often get torn and ripped. And that's why, you know, not washing our hands is totally insufficient. Um, the other challenge with using gloves is we do have to have well dried hands before you put those on. Most gloves do not work well uh, going on to wet hands, so sometimes that can be a challenge if we do have improvised facilities. Uh, and we always want to wash our hands after we use the gloves. One area where we do want to possibly think about implementing a glove use is when we have any sort of wound or bandage on our hands. So if we have a bandage, it's always good to have an additional barrier on top of that, just to make certain we're not having contact between an open wound and any sort of product or product's uh, surface. And so having that glove as an additional barrier on top of proper hand washing, on top of using bandages is good. One caution we do want to think about, uh, if we're using latex gloves, maybe we don't have an allergy to it, but what about subsequent customers? So we probably want to stay away from using a latex glove, possibly vinyl, nitrile, or something like that. Cloth gloves typically become soiled and can become uh, sources of contamination. So maybe for some of the harvest activities, uh, they would be appropriate, but typically when we're handling product, we want to stay away from cloth gloves directly. And it's important to mention that when we use gloves improperly, it's just as dangerous as not washing your hands. So it does go back to Gloves don't solve any problem. They don't remove contamination. They're simply a barrier that can be helpful. We do need to mention the difference between cleaning and sanitizing when it comes to uh, herb contact surfaces or food contact surfaces, because clean is pretty straightforward for most of us. Is it free from obvious dirt or soiling? But we have to ask the question, is that good enough when we're talking about food or herbs? Because again, produce, we typically think of as a food product, herbs, you know, we might actually think of them more in the medicinal sense. So maybe we're thinking of it as medicine. So it's just a clean surface, okay, for medicine we're gonna be uh, putting into uh, the system. And absolutely not, because what clean doesn't address is the microbial contamination that's possible. So cleaning, if we boil it down to the very simplest steps, uh, it have washing, rinsing, and then finally sanitizing as the final step. What we do with washing and, uh, is to actually remove dirt and debris. It requires physical action, as well as the use of a soap or detergent. Uh, sometimes people will ask questions, well, is there a specific soap or detergent we should use? Um, not really, because basically any soap or detergent we're using, we don't want in contact directly with food or medicinal herbs. So what we have to do is do an effective rinsing process after we use the, that soap or detergent. Um, but we do have to use soap or detergent because it helps us remove um, oils and waxes and other things like that that are naturally present within plants uh, that can actually hide essentially microbial contaminants. So when we rinse uh, after we've used soap and physical action, typically scrubbing, things of that nature, uh, we're able to remove all the material that's on the surface as well as to the detergent. We do have to use potable water to do this, 
again, we can't use contaminated water or suspect water to do this effectively. And then the last and final step is sanitizing. And when we say sanitizing, we're actually talking about killing microorganisms that may be present. Um, sanitize, if we're looking at a technical uh, sort of definition, it's when microorganisms are reduced to safe levels from a public health point of view. This points to whenever you've seen products on TV or advertised, and they talk about kills 99.9% .9 of you know, uh, germs, things of that nature. It's not that it kills every single potential microorganism there. It just, it greatly reduces the population. It goes back to the dose makes the poison. The fewer microorganisms present, the less likely we are to have an illness. Sanitization or sanitizing only happens as part of a three-step process. We can't cut out uh, washing and rinsing and skip to sanitizing. It doesn't work. It's only part of a three-step process. One of the things that is, I think, applicable to talk about a little bit are what specific sanitizers or what are we looking for? How do we know we've got a product that we can use? Um, one of the things we can point to, and it's not always a requirement because we know that we have a lot of medicinal herb uh, growers that are not organic certified. But if we look at the organic certification world, there are two commonly used products that are both effective and also allowed for organic certification chlorine and paracetic acid. You'll also hear it referred to as peroxyacetic acid or even abbreviated as PAA. So chlorine is pretty common. PAA is a little less common. We're not gonna probably find that as a household cleaner like we would chlorine products. Uh, again, if you are certified organic, I would stress that you consult with your certifier to make sure any product you use is acceptable and don't just take a raw uh, uh, standard of chlorine's okay and use any product. One thing that does sometimes pop up is how do we know if a product we have is acceptable for use, uh, whether we're talking about produce or medicinal herbs. One of the things is reading the product label. Uh, and so for instance, this is one of any number of disinfecting wipes that are out there and available for use. And if we actually start reading on the surface, it tells us that for surfaces that may come in contact with a food, a potable water rinse is required. So is it okay to use this product as a sanitizing step on a, a food contact or herb uh, contact surface? The short answer is yes, but only if followed by a potable water rinse. So what we're actually saying is there cannot be direct contact between this product and a food product or a medicinal herb product. So understanding what is an allowable um, sanitizer is important. Uh, this is something that you could discuss with your buyers. They can help lead you down uh, this discussion and what's acceptable to them. So one of the things that we talk about, if we take carry over from that example and say, okay, let's look at labels. Well, if we see this product, which is readily available uh, uh, off the shelf in stores, and uh, this is not an ag product. I didn't get uh, this picture from a, uh, you know, farm supply store. You know, if we look at this product, there's absolutely zero mention of produce, food, or agricultural purposes on this label. It simply is not there. However, if we look at that label closely, there's a little bit more there than we might first guess. There is actually an EPA registration number associated with this product, and you'll see it there on your screen. And of course, you know, the first question is why on earth do we see an EPA registration number for this product? EPA registration numbers are for pesticide products. Uh, clearly, this is a sanitizer. Well, there is actually a class of products that are called antimicrobial pesticides, which is another way of saying sanitizers. So this is actually a EPA regulated uh, pesticide product, which is sometimes surprising. And so if we actually take this EPA registration number and we look up that registration with the EPA, we actually get a 50 some page document that's actually the product label. And there's actually a tremendous number of different agricultural uses that this product is acceptable uh, for use as. So for instance, I have on my screen, because uh, this is one I present to uh, produce growers a lot, it's actually allowed for washing fruit and vegetables, 
only in a commercial situation, and you're limited to a sanitizing solution of 25 parts per billion. Um, and then additionally, uh, you have to rinse the fruit with potable water only prior to packaging. So it is allowed for use in agricultural situations, a number of different ones, uh, whether livestock or even phytosanitary, looking at diseases and things like uh, nursery stock and things of that nature, which is kind of surprising, but this is actually an EPA regulated product. And the only way we know all those uses is to actually consult the label and we actually have to go online to find that. And what's great about it is included in the label is actually a dilution table, so we know how much of this product to add to so many gallons of water in order to get, for instance, 25 parts per meal. And so it's a great tool to have if you're going to be using something like a chlorine product. Again, you have to look on that specific product. If it does not have an EPA registration number and you're not able to go and review the allowances for that, I would not use it. I would only use a product that has a, an EPA number and that you've reviewed that label for. So I wouldn't necessarily buy a generic chlorine product. You may have to go with the name brand product. I'll just mention briefly that if we're talking about third-party gap audits, which is not the norm for most uh, uh, medicinal herb buyers, um, so this probably doesn't apply to a lot of folks, but like we as an aggregation facility, uh, are GAP uh, certified, but it's important to document every time you clean and sanitize because it shows that you're doing the proper things. Um, if you're familiar with the Food Safety Modernization Act, which we're not gonna cover in this talk tonight, uh, it's a component of that as well. So it's really, I think, a good idea to get in the habit of whenever we are doing things such as cleaning and sanitizing, we keep track of that. It can be as simple as utilizing a calendar or things of that nature. Uh, or even electronic, if that's your preference. It is important to dig a little bit deeper on uh, when we're talking about sanitizing. One of the things is not all surfaces are easily sanitized and some can be easier to do than others. So when we look at like wood versus plastics versus metals, wood is probably the least able to be sanitized. Metals are probably the most able to be sanitized. However, the individual conditions of those surfaces comes into play. So a heavily scratched or rusted metal surface is not gonna be super easy to sanitize, whereas a nice, smooth, undamaged plastic surface would be. So we do have to take into consideration the specifics. This may mean from time to time we have to update uh, any sort of equipment or surfaces we're utilizing and maintain those in good condition to be able to effectively sanitize. Do focus on equipment that has direct contact with the produce or medicinal herbs. So things such as sorting and grading tables, we have any sort of conveyor belts or washing equipment, hoppers and harvest containers. Harvest containers are something that uh, it's easy to forget about their importance in the whole food safety matter, but harvest containers have direct contact with that harvested product. So we wanna pay careful attention to those and actually have those uh, sanitized. How often do we have to clean or sanitize? It can depend on many factors. One of the largest is how often are we using it? Obviously, if you're digging black cohosh once a year, you're not gonna be cleaning your equipment daily, but clean it immediately before you start uh, harvesting would be a good plan. Uh, if you're doing different products, it's not a bad idea to have uh, a break in there, which is known as a clean break within the industry where you are separating different lots of material. It could be dug from different areas, it could be different species or different sources of products. What that does, that allows you to prevent contamination from one area or one thing being carried over and multiplied onto the others. So again, uh, cleaning as often as you need it. Harvest containers, I've already mentioned this, but um, this is a good example of a picture that was actually taken in a pepper field. Um, you have guys uh, utilizing larger containers uh, that they're filling from the harvest containers they're using. Uh, and in this picture, you see a worker has his hand on the very bottom of that container and it's boosting it up to the guy on the trailer to fill the large bins. Um, the issue with that is, what if the bottom of that container had been setting in something that was contaminating, that had an issue? Now he's just put his hand into that contaminated surface and now when he goes to picking peppers again, he's going to be transferring that contamination directly onto the 
that's why it can be important to do uh, a thorough cleaning and sanitation process with harvest containers because they can become that source of contamination. Even indirectly like this, it wasn't on the inside of the container, but what if it was on the bottom? Uh, and again, if you have a situation where you have wooden containers, as those start aging out, as you have to start to replace them, look at using plastic or even metal if appropriate, um, so they can be more easily sanitized. Uh, we do want to pay attention to how we're handling those harvest containers. Uh, Soil can be a, a source of contamination. Not always, obviously our product is growing in soil, so it's not that we're scared of soil being associated with uh, containers, but it can be an indicator that we've got uh, containers that aren't being cleaned and sanitized regularly. Um, we do want to store them properly after we've cleaned and sanitized them. So oftentimes if it's something with like a solid bottom, turning them upside down on a clean surface is a good plan that keeps dust and things like that from uh, settling in them. Uh, we can also cover them with a clean cover. Uh, sometimes that can be as simple as a piece of clean cardboard or any other sort of plastic cover. Um, one thing that's important sometimes, especially with plastic bins that we're using for harvesting, they're very useful as a container. So they get used for any number of different activities on a farm. We want to make sure that only produce goes into harvest containers. So if we take one and use it to hold tools or if we use one to catch oil or we're doing some equipment maintenance or whatever, we want to clearly label those as not being harvest containers. Uh, that way we don't use them for something else and then reintroduce them into a harvest program and have a contamination issue. Another thing that's important, probably not directly applicable to most medicinal herb situations, we don't want to stand inside bins when we're harvesting or filling them. Uh, sometimes in an orchard scenario, we can see that within the produce world, but certainly uh, standing in bins or otherwise contaminating them are not a good plan. Harvest tools. Uh, I know, you know, a lot of wild crafted herbs uh, are dug with any number of different tools. Uh, ideally, uh, we'd be washing and sanitize those before each use. Um, in a perfect world, they, we wouldn't have wooden handles on those because again, wood handles are not the easiest to sanitize, plastics are a little bit easier. So again, not allowing our tools to become a source of contamination, cleaning those after each use uh, and making sure they're ready to go uh, is a good plan. Another concern that we have when it comes with produce is how are we transporting it? Um, so, you know, with a lot of uh, vegetables and fruit, we see them transported in open trucks or on trailers. Uh, when we do that, we want to see them either wrapped uh, as a pallet or covered with tarps to keep uh, uh, any dust or road debris or anything like that from settling on the product. By extension, we would see the same things hopefully with uh, medicinal herb products. Typically, it's a smaller volume, so it's not uncommon to see those uh, in a uh, vehicle a personal vehicle rather than something like a trailer. Uh, certainly that's acceptable to be careful if you allow pets to ride in the vehicle. If you're doing things like that, then you need to make sure that either you're cleaning your vehicles thoroughly or maybe you're utilizing tarps or drop cloths that themselves are clean as a barrier so that the vehicle or other transport mechanism doesn't become a source of product contamination. Um, so definitely pay attention to that. You can do everything well up until the point that you put it into your vehicle. And if the vehicle is a source of contamination issue, then we have an issue. Um, I will mention that if you want to dig a little more deeply on GAP, uh, we do have an excellent resource. Uh, Cornell is kind of the great grandfather of GAP within the U.S. Uh, their uh, Good Agricultural Practices program has a number of different templates and resources, decision trees. That's just absolutely excellent. They also offer an online course that allows you to dig deeper into GAP in more detail. So if this is something that has uh, intrigued you, I'd encourage you to take a look at that. I would additionally uh, mention that uh, talking to your local extension office about good agricultural practices, a lot of states have developed materials uh, specific for their state, as well as there may be resources either through extension or sometimes private entities. Uh, for instance, Appalachian Sustainable Development does a lot of training around good agricultural practices. 
uh, because uh, our buyers of produce ultimately require it. So we do a lot of training and consulting with our farmers. Uh, we're not alone in that. Across central Appalachia, you will find a lot of non-government entities uh, that are doing outreach efforts associated with it. So lots of times local extension office can be a good starting source. I'll also mention that there are some excellent resources for specific uh, aspects of medicinal herb harvesting. Um, and these concern things that aren't necessarily talked about in this talk. Uh, that's a little more about good manufacturing practices and things like that. Um, North Carolina State has an excellent uh, resource that's available to you. The World Health Organization and then the American Herbal Products Association uh, are both uh, excellent resources. You'll actually get these links in an email that you'll receive tomorrow uh, from the webinar system. So don't worry about trying to write these down tonight necessarily. We'll be able to have clickable links uh, for these and that way you can access them easily. And next, uh, Katie, are you there? Hello. I can hear you, Katie. All right. I'm unmuted. Thank you, Adam, so much for sharing some of your wisdom and, and good insight on just little tips and, and tricks of the trade that we can implement every day, whether we're growing medicinal herbs in a field or a forest um, or out wild crafting herbs. Um, a lot of these are, are common sense things to keep in mind, but um, really helpful. And, and one of the reasons why we wanted to offer this training uh, today, first and foremost, when we're uh, growing or collecting medicinal herbs, we want to make sure that um, we're not harming anyone, right? So we wanna make sure we're not getting anybody sick. And also, uh, depending on which buyer you're selling to, um, they may re require you to send in a sample. Uh, and with that sample, they will oftentimes do quality testing. Um, and so that's going to be looking at yeast and mold counts and uh, microbial counts, E. coli, um, a variety of different things, as well as just looking at um, visually the amount of extraneous matter that's in your herbs. Um, so does it include rocks and dirt? Um, is it, if you are selling black cohosh, for instance, um, are there leaves also included in the root that you're providing? Is it mixed in with other species? Um, and ability to meet the criteria that these buyers set out when they're testing these samples um, is really gonna determine whether or not your product is accepted or if it's rejected. Um, and so these are some really helpful tips that I think we can all utilize uh, moving forward and, and keep in the back of your mind um, to make sure that we're doing our best to meet some of these criteria so that we're um, not getting anybody sick and, and we make sure that um, we're meeting uh, buyer quality standards. So um, just a little uh, background, um, in, in addition to the resources that Adam mentioned, I also wanted to talk to you a little bit about the services that Appalachian Sustainable Development has available for medicinal herb farmers. I'm Katie and I'm the Agroforestry Program Director. Uh, and our Agroforestry Program was founded back in 2010. And we work with medicinal herb farmers, whether you're forest farming, so growing things like ginseng and golden seal in the forest understory, or um, if you're out uh, wild harvesting, field grown medicinal herbs or cultivating them in a field setting. Um, maybe you're growing elderberries in a riparian buffer, um, or we could work with you on growing field grown herbs, maybe like peppermint and nettles. Uh, in the alleyways of elderberries, so in an alley cropping system. All really great agroforestry practices that benefit um, both you as a farmer for production and also uh, great environmental benefits. And in 2017, we expanded our Appalachian Harvest Food Hub that Adam's been talking about, which was founded in 2000. Um, to include uh, the Appalachian Harvest Herb Hub, and that's the flyer that you see here. Um, and really what our vision is, is trying to create a thriving and sustainable herbal economy uh, 
um, in central Appalachia, where we're based in Duffield, Virginia, um, where plant conservation can be achieved through cultivation. Um, and so initially we've been focusing on at-risk uh, forest botanicals, but like I said, expanding to field-grown herbs too as an opportunity for farmers in our region. Um, and with input from our local community on the needs of, of certain services that um, would be beneficial, we offer the, the following um, services to help you. So first, um, we provide training such as this one on anything from seed to sale that you might need to be successful in growing medicinal herbs for market. Um, so things like propagation, um, processing, if you need help with organic certification, we can provide that assistance as well. Uh, and then as grant funding is available, we can offer cost share. Um, and that could be for planting stock um, to get you started with an operation, um, as well as some cost share funding to offset uh, certification fees. Um, so we're working right now with a, a specific certification for forest botanicals called forest grown verification. Um, and with grant funding from our generous funders, we've been able to offer some cost share to offset that initial startup. At our facility in Duffield, um, we have a 15,000 square foot facility. Adam mentioned that it's GAP certified. We're also organic certified and forest grown verified, which means farmers who have those certifications um, can work with our facility and we can help um, sell product out of that. But our facility, we have processing equipment available for medicinal herb farmers. So we have commercial washing and drying equipment. Um, and recently this year, we're onboarding some resizing equipment um, to help garble and chop up herbs into smaller pieces to meet buyer standards. So rather than having to go out and all farmers individually purchasing expensive equipment, we have that housed here in Duffield at one central location in a shared use facility for multiple farmers and our medicinal herb community to use. And then lastly, if you have your own markets lined up, um, you're welcome to use the facility if you need some help in accessing markets. We work with um, a wonderful network of buyers across the US and now also internationally. And so we can provide aggregation services to help meet volume minimums. So say if a buyer requires 100 pounds and you have 50 and another farmer has 50, we can help aggregate that product together to meet uh, that volume minimum from that buyer um, and help connect you to uh, some new markets. So that's a list of the services that we offer. And my contact information is down at the bottom of this flyer. Uh, our phone number is 276-623-1121 in case you can't read it. And my email is kcommender at asdevelop.org. Uh, and I believe in the email that Adam will be sending out tomorrow, uh, my contact information will be in there as well in case you'd like to follow up. But I think with that, we're gonna open it up for questions. Yeah, so if you have any questions, you can utilize either the question and answer function or the chat function. Uh, and as Katie mentioned, you will actually be receiving a follow-up email tomorrow that does have her contact information in it as well as mine. Feel free to reach out to us if you have any questions. And we'll give everybody just a second to submit any questions this evening. Um, I will mention if you're not familiar with Appalachian Sustainable Development, uh, or even if you are, I encourage you to follow us on our different social media channels. It's probably the best way to make sure you don't miss uh, training opportunities such as this. Uh, there's also a number of different events that happen throughout the year that you may be interested in. So we encourage you to take advantage of those outlets. Uh, and real quickly, let me check. I am not currently seeing any questions on the question and answer. And I'm not seeing anything in the chat box. So with that, uh, I'll just say thank you to Katie for joining us and thank you for everybody else. And please uh, reach out if you have any additional questions for us. Thank you. Oh wait, we do have one question. Here we go. Okay. Actually, now they're populating in here. Here we go. Okay, we have one question. Uh, do you have available sales and marketing info, including cost and crop opportunity? Uh, Katie, are you still on here? I am, yes. Um, so you want yeah, to handle so that one? We, 
we can uh, follow up and share some of that information in terms of uh, in terms of costs. Are you talking about like an enterprise budget of, of how much it would cost to implement, um, like let's say uh, an echinacea planting? Um, we we can we definitely have some resources that we can share uh, for that. And for crop opportunities, we can share uh, a list of what our buyers are looking for and prices that they're paying. Um, so yeah, we can definitely follow up on that. And there was a similar question uh, this year, and the clarification on the first, uh, more pricing of end product rather than cost. Mm -hmm. so, so certainly for some commodities, we have a history of pricing on that. Uh, for some of the newer commodities, maybe less of a history, but certainly some uh, price points are available. Uh, and then there was a similar question, uh, is there demand for new growers? Uh, I think you kind of answered that. Uh, would it be best for folks to reach out to you directly? Yes, I would say if, if you are interested in getting more information, uh, the email follow-up for tomorrow will have my contact information. So you could email me specific questions, um, clarifications, and, and any additional resources or, or such that you might need for sure. So thank you all for using the question and answer function. It may have been a little slow to pop in here, but I'm yeah. glad we got those in here. Uh, anything else before we go from anyone? I guess one thing that popped into my mind, Adam, is, as you were going through the slides, um, in terms of field selection, I know a lot of medicinal herbs are, are wild, harvested or wild crafted, and so thinking about not necessarily where you're planting, but looking around at your surroundings of where you're harvesting. So if you find a, a nice elderberry patch that's under uh, or mullein or you know whatever it may be underneath um, power lines, you know thinking about what's being sprayed along the power lines, exhaust fumes, that kind of stuff. Um, so thinking about contamination in that sense um, in a wild setting as well. Uh, absolutely. Uh, one consideration we always look at with produce is, you know, what happens on a roadway adjacent to a farm? Uh, so I think we would definitely, there's any number of, uh, you know, wild harvested botanicals we can see growing along our roadsides in the region, uh, but would those be the best source? Are they free from contamination, whether chemical or otherwise? Who knows, quite honestly. Uh, so absolutely, sometimes it's just being aware of what's happening around uh, where you're at. Uh, and again, it doesn't mean we can't necessarily use an area or, or harvest from an area, but do we pay attention to what's being indicated to us if there are perhaps some warning flags there? Do we pay attention to it? Um, so again, just being adaptable and willing to assess the situation is important. Another question that I've frequently been asked um, by medicinal herb growers is, and, and maybe you don't know the answer, but we can direct to, to resources where they might be able to find the answer, but if, if a medicinal herb is being harvested and then tinctured, is that considered a kill step for any potential contamination or, um, that, or not? Well, in theory, it could be, uh, because obviously you're dealing with alcohol. So I mean, mm -hmm. it, conceptually, it's an excellent question. Um, and again, you know, kill steps are not required for any of our herbal products. But I would always still, you know, even if I have a product that's going through a kill step, uh, produce, for instance, if if I'm doing apples and I know it's going to be pasteurized you'll still find that, you know, a, a lot of that growers won't pick up apples off of the ground because it's a higher risk. Mm -hmm. So I still think even if we had a kill step, if there is a, a risk present with a harvested product, I still think, you know, that one one hundredth of a you know chance that maybe something could persist through the process. Um, it's enough of a concern that you would still avoid that possibly contaminating product. Okay. Because uh, sometimes kill steps fail. Uh, you know, that's why, you know, in theory, if we always cooked meat to an appropriate temperature, there would never be a foodborne illness related to a meat product. But we know that that doesn't always happen. Um, so I, I would still say never knowingly uh, utilize a contaminated product, even if going to a kill step. Mm -hmm. Excellent. 
as and I, I don't. The last, last comment that I had in thinking back to your slides, um, again, mm -hmm. this kind of goes to to where you're, you're placing your field. Um, we might have some forest farmers on the line right now. And I'm, I'm thinking back to site selection for where you might want to grow forest botanicals like ginseng and golden seal. And really looking at, you know, is there a deer trail nearby? And do you see a lot of droppings? Because if so, then that might not be, A, they're gonna likely eat your crop, but B, it's a definite source of contamination. So um, just making sure that you're aware of surroundings again. Um, yeah, uh, in the natural topography, there are uh, avenues that are more highly traveled than others. There are choke points that funnel a lot of activity into a given area and things like that. Hunters utilize those whenever they're trying to you know, locate game. Um, so paying attention to that is important because, yeah, if you have uh, your product in proximity to more animals, you're more likely to see an issue that may prevent you from harvesting. So again, it is a natural environment. We know there's animals there, but again, uh, those highest risk things, animal fecal matter in close proximity to our crop, direct feeding or rooting, things like that on the crop, or all those red flags that were really going to give us a pause and evaluate the situation. All right, uh, with that, uh, I'll just say again, thank you all for uh, connecting with us this evening. If you have any follow-up, please reach out to us. Thank you.